Well, this morning we are going to be uh, looking at, um, you might say, a, a mini-series that is really intended to close the larger series that we were looking at before um, I went on vacation with, with my family. And of course that has to do with um, what Jesus Christ is like because uh, that is the image in which we are predestined to become conformed to. Uh, what I would like to do is, is examine the idea of holiness, what it is. It's two different senses and what that holiness actually calls us to be, what it calls us to do. I'd like to uh, open the subject by um, reading for you First Peter chapter 1. Actually, I'd like to read for you the entire chapter, but we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16. Uh, which is going to be repeating what we've seen in our meditation, the fact that God is holy and how that calls us to be holy. Now, I realize that that can often look like something very uh, austere, something very fearful, and it should, but we also need to realize it is a great honor and privilege, and it is because we have the Spirit of God in our hearts, having trusted Jesus Christ. It is what we want. It is what we love. It's what we desire. So let's, um, let's begin by reading 1 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll begin to look at the idea of holiness. This is what we read. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which, have, which, have, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb un unblemished and spotless, 
the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have not been born, or you, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, to the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Again, a reminder of the brevity of life and anything you might hope to gain in this world apart from Christ. It's like the glory of grass, which appears for a little while, one day, and then the sun scorches it, withers, and it falls off. But notice the word of the, God, uh, the, word of the Lord endures forever, which means that though we may be perishable, this is eternal. And if we want, as I hope we do, to be with the Lord in glory, we do need to pay attention to this word because this isn't the word of man. This is the word of God. Now, as I already mentioned last time, we were considering what Jesus is like. We were considering how it is that Jesus Christ lived. What was his character? So that we could see what it is that really God wants us to be. We need to remember that Jesus lived as he lived, uh, not only to save us, although he did, and we're very, very thankful for that, but also to provide an example for us to follow. Uh, God's whole purpose in saving us was not just that we would be safe from hell, but that we might become more like Jesus Christ. Again, I would remind you what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now again, I know oftentimes we apply this passage uh, merely to what's going to take place when we arrive in heaven. We're finally going to be like him. But let's not forget, he begins that work on earth. He begins to make us more like Jesus as soon as we trust in him. Uh, it's something he doesn't complete in this world, but something he certainly begins. But I thought rather than going, uh, you know, having this series go on indefinitely, which actually it could because there's so many facets to the character of Jesus. He is our perfect example in absolutely everything. I thought rather than just go on and examining everything there is to, to know about Jesus Christ, that I would conclude with a short series that really summarizes everything that is true about Jesus' character, and that is his holiness. Uh, God is holy, therefore Jesus is holy because he is God in human flesh. He is the Son of God made man. And he has given us his Holy Spirit so that we too might be holy, which means that we might become like God, that we might become like Jesus Christ morally. You know, we don't gain his infinite power but we are to gain his love for what is good and right and his hatred for what is evil. Jesus described himself to the church in Philadelphia in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. He who is holy, who is true. That's how Jesus describes himself. Peter, speaking uh, for the disciples, said to Jesus in John 6:69. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. As a matter of fact, even the demons recognized this about Jesus. Uh, when, he was, when Legion was confronted, he says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Now, you also know that this is true, that there was never anyone who was more perfect than Christ Anyone that was more upright, who devoted himself you know, more completely than Jesus did to carry out the will of his Father. Jesus is perfectly holy. But again, do you realize that 
that life that Jesus lived, that perfection, is an example that the Lord calls you and me to follow. He calls you to be the same as Jesus in this way. Again, I would remind you what our text says in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy holy. I mean, let's not forget that is why God sent Jesus into the world in the first place was to make you holy. So this morning, let's begin this short series. And again, it's going to be relatively short. I'm thinking maybe three or four sermons. But let's begin by considering what holiness is. What does the word mean? Now, again, there's two facets to it. As I've already mentioned, it refers to a Uh, setting apart the idea of a separation being set apart from one thing to another thing and that's its basic meaning but it actually has two applications by the way I should also mention the word holy as far as I can see only has reference to God in other words you know if, if I set something apart for my use that doesn't make it holy but if God sets it apart for his use that does. And the idea of holiness with regard to being set apart refers not only to possession and ownership of something, but it also refers to, uh, it has a moral you know, application as well. A being set apart to the Holy One means that we are to also be separate from something that is moral evil, that is sin. But what I'd like to do right now is simply develop that first aspect of it and and begin to give hints of what kind of life that calls us to live. Now, we've already seen from our text and from our readings that God himself is holy, which means that there's some sense in which he is set apart. Uh, We read in Psalm 99, verse 5, for instance, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Uh, We read in our meditation, uh, basically one of the texts that that, uh, Peter's could be based upon in Leviticus 19 verses 1 through 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You should be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, when this word is applied to God, it refers to his separation from sin. It refers to his moral uprightness. It it refers to his perfect love for what is good and for what is right. David writes in Psalm 145, verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. This is describing the holiness of God. Now, it not only describes, of course, his love for what is good, it also describes his perfect hatred of what is evil. Habakkuk writes in, in his, well, again, in the minor, uh, one of the minor prophets, his book Habakkuk 1, verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Now, God's holiness means that he is, as I've said, separate from sin. I've already alluded to the fact that James tells us that in God there is no variation, there is no shifting shadow, God is light. And, of course, we saw that also in 1 John. God is light. The one who would walk with him must walk where he is, in the light. That is referring to his holiness. That is referring to his separation from sin, that there is no sin in him, no imperfection, no desire for what is evil, but only a pure and holy, well, a pure and perfect desire for what is good. That is what holiness is. And again, what is good is what is loving. And that is why we should also, all of us, love holiness. By the way, his, his holiness, his separation from sin is also the reason why God is separate from sinners. And why you and I cannot approach him, nor can anyone else, 
except through a mediator. God's holiness is the reason why He has given us someone who can stand between us and can reconcile us with Him, who can take care of the sin issue and can make us holy. This is why God provided His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might have fellowship with Him, that we might become holy, so that we might. So holiness applied to God refers to His separation from sin. Now when holiness is applied to things, it means that those things are separated to God for His use, exclusively for His use. Let me give you a couple of examples. The oil that was used uh, in the Old Testament worship of God that was used to, in a certain sense, sanctify the priests, sanctify the furniture within the tabernacle, sanctify the tabernacle itself. That oil was applied to these things. That oil was said to be holy, which means it was exclusively for God's use. Exodus chapter 30, verses 23 through 25, the Lord said this, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, and a fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250, and a fragrant cane, 250, and of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hin. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. Now, again, holy means... This is only for God's use. We're going to see that in just a moment. But I want to also point out that in that same chapter, the incense of the priest was to use to burn in the tabernacle for the worship of God was also said to be holy. Verses 34 through 36, And the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourself spices, stacti, on, and onica and galbanum, spices with pure frankincense, there shall be an equal part of each. With it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Now again, holiness means these things were set apart exclusively for God's use. And because they were, ex these things were exclusively for him, if, if anyone would take what was holy to the Lord and even make something like it and use it for themselves, well, God actually said there were serious consequences for that. Uh, those who would do such a thing would be cut off from his people. Verses 31 through 33 of the same chapter. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. And then the incense, verses 37 through 38, the incense which you shall make. You shall not make in the same proportions for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use his perfume shall be cut off from his people. I think the Lord was trying to teach them something. He was trying to, to put the fear of him in their hearts, but he was also trying to teach them what holiness means and that God is serious. You know, not only were God's people to treat the things that he had set aside to himself as holy. But God actually required those who weren't a part of his people to treat those things as holy as well and even exacted the same judgment on them if they should treat those things as common. Uh, there's one grand example in Scripture. Perhaps you'll recall when Belshazzar, uh, who was the son of, of Nebuchadnezzar, was having this, this feast on one occasion and he thought, hey, it'd be a great idea if we take all those silver and gold cups and vessels that we got from the temple of God that my, my father Nebuchadnezzar uh, brought into uh, Babylon when he, he took captive the Jewish people, let's bring those things out. Let's put wine in these things and let's drink to the gods of silver and gold. Well, as they did that and as they were doing that, you'll remember the hand appeared 
and began to write on the wall and he didn't understand what it meant and so he called for somebody to interpret Daniel interpreted and said basically king your kingdom has been weighed in the balances it's been found wanting and this very night your life is going to be taken from you because he treated God as unholy God took his life in judgment you see God is holy and he needs to be treated as holy and what is holy to him he is very jealous over that because it belongs to him it is his possession for his use by the way we're going to get to the point that if you trusted Jesus you also were holy which means you belong to him and he is jealous over you that's actually going to be the topic for a future sermon now when it's applied to places those places also belong to him the land of promise was cons was said to be holy it was a land that belonged to him and he was going to give it to his people the psalmist writes in Psalm 78 verses 52 through 55 but he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock he led them safely so that they did not fear but the sea engulfed their enemies so he brought them to his holy land to this hill country which his right hand had gained he also drove out the nations before them and apportioned them for an inheritance by measurement and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents the holy land the land of Palestine the land that God had promised to give to Abraham that was holy belonged to the Lord and he gives it to his people he specifically set Jerusalem apart to be the city that would be his city where he would place his name, the city that belonged to him. In Psalm 48, verse 8, as we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts and the city of our God. God will establish her forever. There's going to be a point to, to all of this that applies to us, so do, do continue to, to pay attention. Now, when it's applied to time, that time also belongs to the Lord. It is His possession to be set apart for His use. Uh, that's what the Sabbath, that's what the fourth commandment, that's what the Lord's Day is all about. Exodus 31 verses 13 through 17 again gives us another very, um, might say, uh, stern warning to use this time for God's glory. God says to Moses, uh, beginning in verse 13, but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Now I, I can't just pass over this without saying a few words, right? Because we're not used to hearing this, are we? Whoever breaks the Sabbath is going to be put to death. Uh, we're, we're so used to hearing about grace and mercy that we want to escape the idea that this, this is even a possibility. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we say, well, this isn't really for us because God spoke this to Israel. It, it, it was a part of Israel's worship. It was a part of the Old Testament and all that's done away with. Well, you know what? We don't believe that that's true. We believe that the church, as a matter of fact, is the continuation of God's dealings with Israel. This is how God continues his covenant work. We're not plan B. We're plan A. Uh, this applies to us, and again, it's because the church is the Israel of God. I mean, think about this. What is the church made of? Who is it that Jesus proclaimed the gospel to? What was the gospel all about? Wasn't it the promises God made to Israel that he was going to send the Messiah? Did everyone reject Jesus Christ? Not everyone. 
the Jews who, well, whom the Lord had mercy on who received their Messiah and they received everything God had promised. Well, who are those Jews that received Jesus Christ? They're the church, the New Testament church. And then to whom did the Lord reach out to next? But the Gentiles, and what did he do with them? He brought them into the church and made them one with those believing Jews. Consider what uh, Paul writes to the Gentile believers in Ephesus in Ephesians 2, verses 12 through 13 and verses 19 through 22. <coughs> Speaking to the Gentiles, he says this, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the, the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So basically what Paul is saying is that, yes, the Gentiles were separate from Christ. Notice they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They had nothing to do with the promises of God. They were strangers to the covenants. They had no hope. They did not have God because they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. But those who were far off have been brought near through Christ, and now they're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. God has brought those branches, he says, and Paul says in Romans chapter 11, that were wild olive branches, and he has grafted them in, contrary to nature, into a natural olive tree. And now the Gentiles are partakers with Israel of the blessings of the, of the covenants and the promises of God. In other words, you know, the majority of Israel rejected God's plan for them, but not all of them did. Some of them were saved. And then the Gentiles that God was calling to himself, he brought in. This is the continuation of Israel, which means, as we see, and, and we're not surprised, in the New Testament, we see the authors of the New Testament often quoting from the Old Testament with authority because it is Scripture and because God hasn't set it aside. It still has relevance. So, yes, this passage, the Ten Commandments, God's moral standards still hold. And I should also mention the ceremonial law has been fulfilled by Christ. We don't bring sacrifices any longer. We do recognize there are changes, but there are some things that haven't changed. So we don't just dismiss this. We have to take it seriously. So then let's move to the second point. What about the capital punishment that God requires for the breaking of the Sabbath? Well, let me just remind you, if you read the Old Testament, you're going to find out that there were many sins that required the death penalty. There were many of them. As a matter of fact, we're going to see this evening more clearly. Every sin deserves everlasting damnation in hell. Which is why, of course, we don't want to take sin lightly. Let's remember our breaking of the commandments that they do deserve death. But let's not forget the gospel. In Christ, the Lord doesn't give us what we deserve. He shows us grace. He shows us mercy. He gives us <coughs> what his son deserves and not what we deserve. But be careful. Don't use that as an excuse to sin. I mean, what, what do we usually do when we, we receive grace, 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 and mercy all the time? We begin to think it doesn't really matter to God whether I obey or disobey because he keeps forgiving me of my sins. But you know what? It matters to him. He wants us to do what is right. He always has a good purpose behind everything that he calls us to do. And he has a good purpose behind this as well. So what is holy to the Lord needs to remain holy. We do need to have the fear of the Lord in our hearts as well as thankfulness and love 
for all that he has forgiven us. Because how many times have you and I done things that deserve death? And yet how many times has the Lord spared our lives because of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's not trade on his grace. Let's be thankful. And let's try to do what it is the Lord calls us to do. Now, finally, when holy is applied to people, it obviously means that those people are set apart to God as his possession, that they belong to him. I mean, the old covenant church of Israel was holy to the Lord. Moses said to them before they entered into the Holy Land in Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, that is a tremendous privilege. We're going to look a little bit more at that, uh, not this morning, but, but in the future. But let's get the idea. Holy people, that means they belong to God. Now, the, the new covenant people of God, the church, is also holy to him. Uh, Peter writes of this church in, in chapter 2 of First Peter using, again, as I told you, the New Testament authors reach back into the Old Testament and they apply things to the church that seemingly apply to Israel, but the reason they do is because the church is the continuation of Israel. But this is what he says in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now what this means is the church has been set apart to God. It belongs to Him. The church exists for His use. God intends to use the church to be the heralds, of course, of His salvation. As Peter said, to proclaim His excellencies, particularly those of the gospel. We understand God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, but He now dwells in that temple that He builds made without hands. He dwells in his people. Now again, what is the point of all of this? <clears throat> the point is, if you have trusted Jesus Christ and you've turned from your sins, if you are a believer here this morning, you are holy to the Lord. God has set you apart from this world to be his special possession. If you have trusted Jesus Christ and repented of your sins, God actually lives in you. You are actually His temple uh, by His Holy Spirit, as I think we're, we're, we're very well aware of uh, in Scripture. Uh, you are the temple of the Lord. If you have repented and believed, the Lord has set you apart that you might have the very great privilege of serving Him in His kingdom. It is an honor in the kingdom of heaven to be a servant. Remember, it's not the lords of this world that are going to be honored in that world which is coming. It's going to be the one who humbled himself to serve the most that is going to be the most honored. That's exactly what Jesus did. And that was a privilege. That was an honor. God gives you that same privilege. He has set you apart that you might be his servants. And if you belong to him, he has also called you to that very high calling of moral holiness. To live a life that is different from those of the world, from those who do not know him. And he has done that in order that they may see Christ in you. That they may look at you and know that Jesus lives. That they may read about the gospel in living letters by looking at your life. That, again, is a great privilege the Lord has called you to, a life of holiness. Because you are holy, God calls you to live for His glory. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Again, the idea of because you're the temple of God, how are you to live? He says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, 
glorify God in your body. You can see how all these things are wrapped up in that one statement. You get a, have a better idea of what it is that Paul is actually saying here, what he, what he calls you to do and why he calls you to do that. Uh, you are called to do all that you do for his glory. When he says glorify God in your body, he's not talking just about part-time, but all times. That, that's why Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And of course, being holy means that you are called to live differently from the people of this world because they don't live for the glory of God, even, even part of the time. And even when it looks like they're doing right things, they never do it because they love Him. You are called to live a different kind of life, one that does the will of God and does it because you love Him. Paul writes to the Romans in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, for those of you who may, may never have read this text before, Paul is not saying that you need to find somewhere, a place where they're doing animal sacrifices and throw your body on the altar so that you can be slain and burned on the altar. But he is saying that this is how we, uh, you know, really see those, those Old Testament sacrifices in a certain way. That it is the giving up of this animal wholly to the Lord. And the Lord, of course, does with it what he wills. We are to offer ourselves up wholly to the Lord to do what he wills, which is why he goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world. His will is that you be holy and that you live a life separate and apart. It's a very high calling. It's a privilege and an honor. And it's something that you want to do because you have the Spirit of God living in you. So basically, to summarize, this is what we've seen. You are holy. If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you're holy. If you've turned from your sins, you are holy. You belong to the Lord. You are His temple. You know, God isn't concerned about this building. This isn't any kind of temple. He's not concerned about the rebuilding of a temple anywhere in the world at any time. He has a new temple, and that temple is you. God dwells in you. So you are His temple. You are His servants because He lives in you. You are to glorify God with your bodies. And, of course, you have been entrusted with a very high calling and a very great privilege. It's the greatest privilege that God can bestow on anyone that you would be His servants. Now next week we're going to sort of unpack that a little bit, why it is a great privilege to be God's holy people. But I hope you see that it is. And one of the reasons it is is, is coming in this challenge that I would give to you who haven't trusted Jesus Christ, who haven't repented of your sins. And I'm not talking about whether you've made profession of faith or not. You know, in this church we make profession of faith and we stand up and we publicly own Jesus Christ. And it's easy to stand up here and it's easy to say those words. But it's difficult to actually do what it is you're promising to do. And there are those who have stood up here and say those things who really don't take those words seriously. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. So I'm not asking whether you've stood up here and said those words. But what I'm asking you is, have you trusted Jesus? Are you turning from your sins? You see, let me just challenge you if you haven't. One of the greatest blessings of being holy is that it's only those who are holy that are going to enter into heaven. Jesus says in John 12, verse 26, and I want you to see, even though the word holy doesn't appear here, this is what holiness is. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So who is it that's going to be in heaven? Only those who belong to him. Only those who serve him. Only those who follow him. 
In other words, only those who are actually holy are going to be where Jesus is in heaven. And remember, there's only two places you can be when you die. You can either be in heaven or you can be in hell. And if you're not holy, hell is where you will be. Now, if heaven then is what you hope for, you must be holy. But if you want to be holy, there's really only one way to be holy. You have to trust Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus. Jesus offers himself as a savior. He basically says, whosoever will may come to me. And he also says, the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. You have to come to Jesus. Basically, trust what Jesus did to save sinners. He died on the cross to provide a payment for sin, to satisfy his Father's holiness and justice. He also obeyed God's law perfectly so that he could give a perfect righteousness. And he says, if you come to me and trust me, I'll take away your sins. And I will give you that perfect righteousness. And I will give you the power to live a godly life. I will make you holy, Jesus says. That is the only way. There are not many ways to be holy. There are not many ways to God. There is only one. And that is through Jesus Christ. And again, lip service isn't enough. You really do have to trust him. You really do have to love him. You really do have to turn from your sins. And you really do need to obey him. If you are holy, it's going to be more than just name only. It's going to be in life. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, trust in him. Come to him. He won't turn you away. He will receive you if you will only take hold of him and turn from your sins. May the Lord uh, apply his word again as we need to hear it this morning. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to uh, apply that word to us.